Hi, my name is Courtney. My pronouns are they, them. And welcome to the Translations Film Festival that's running May 5th through the 8th. This is the Eerie Ecstasy panel. And we're going to be talking about a lot of combinations of, you know, how to celebrate your body in a horror conflict. Um, and so I would like to introduce our panelists. Hello, everyone. <laughs> you know, just to kind of start it off easily, if any of you want to begin just to address your names and the films that you've put into the film or the festival. Okay. Sure. Um, my name is Luca Fisher, and uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the producer of uh, JTH3, uh, which is sort of a music video and art film that uh, Alan Amaya directed, and that features myself, uh, Kyler O'Neill, who's uh, another amazing um, trans musician, and uh, our collaborator, Celeste X. Hey, my name is Henry Hansen. I'm the writer director of Bros Before, which is um, a raunchy camp comedy. <clears throat> uh, I'm Jay Kiernan O'Brien. Uh, I am the writer and director of The Yellow Wallpaper, which is a trans adaptation of the short story of the same name. And hi, I'm Alan Amaya. I'm the director of JTH3, which is a horror glam music video art vid. Um, yeah, thanks. Beautiful. Thank you all. I'm curious if any of you would like to begin kind of speaking on, you know, because this is like a combination of horror and, you know, exotic <laughs> ecstasy, I guess I'll say. Um, do any of you have like any specific inspirations that had come from the horror genre previous to filming? Uh, I definitely did. I took a lot of inspiration from the craft, uh, the 90s version, and also the Love Witch. And it was in conversation with Luca. We were really excited to, to go that route um, for our inspiration. And is yeah. that, I'll just, for a follow-up, is that something that you've um, been examining like for a while, like your interest in horror as a genre, or is that recently that you found a love for it? Definitely. Well, it's not recent. I think that I've always had like a, I don't know, empathetic feeling about horror and monsters and villains. And just because I feel like usually they're, the queers that were depicted in media. And so that's, I don't know, I've always had an attraction towards it. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I grew up with horror and when I was like 14, I started working even at a horror comic book company. Huh. And um, I did that for about a decade and I've made a bunch of sort of like queer horror shorts. But um, for me, it's sort of funny because looking back on it all, um, you sort of realize how much of a, that gravitation towards the horror genre was connected both to sort of perceiving a kind of queerness um, within the storylines. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, like Jack Halberstam talks about in skin shows with like the transphobia of like mainstream horror movies, like Silence of the Lambs and so forth. But I also think a lot of the sort of like femme icons or um, gender queer icons I found in those films. Um, it's not exactly a horror movie, but I always had the biggest crush on um, Vasquez from Aliens and uh, also on Sigourney Weaver and the whole franchise of Aliens. And so, and you know, Jimmy Lee Curtis and so forth. So I, I think there's sort of a rich and interesting um, tradition about that. Uh, sorry, I was just checking my phone because I was trying to guilt Kyler into being here. Uh, uh, can't make it. But uh, she also always wanted to like play a villain. And the first video we did together with Alan's partner, um, Satan's Tears, was very much about this experience of sort of being othered purely by virtue of being trans or 
uh, in her case, you know, being African American and these other sort of subjectivities that make people uh, sort of dominant, you know, white supremacist, mm -hmm. transphobic, et cetera, phobic uh, society to just really not do the best by people. And so I think having those sort of sympathetic or psychedelic takes is of interest to us. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll say, um... I had a very similar uh, situation, but I also came into it from a, a literature perspective of like horror, um, like Edgar Allan Poe. And then of course, a story like this Char by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Um, and I had a, I, I immediately understood the, the real horror just being representative of some sort of anxiety. And often that has been weaponized against people um, like with, blatant transphobia or racism sort of in the under under layers of horror but i think that brilliant horror like takes a real anxiety we're all working under and just makes it into an allegory and so i was really interested in um taking the gender dysphoria that causes a lot of anxiety and I'm sure many of us um, and utilizing that in a horror context. Love it. <laughs> I know Henry, this doesn't apply as much um, for bros before, but if we can kind of piggyback and more, can you talk about the power of like reclaiming a narrative and using like just being trans as like the sexiest thing in the world rather than like anything else that folks want to, you know, demoralize with. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I will say that I do, even though I didn't really utilize a lot of like um, genre tropes from horror in the content, I do love um, sort of, I'm inspired by the legacy of underground filmmaking. And I think that really intersects with um, the legacy of horror and just, I'm super inspired by like, the way that in horror there's often a lot more space for like low budget and like sort of campy um aesthetics but yeah speak i mean i love how you put it like i was just super frustrated with all of the media about trans people that just seems to focus on um you know trauma or explaining being trans to a cis audience and like it really makes it seem like trans people don't fuck you know which is not but uh the experience that uh i feel like we have in the real world um you know so yeah i just wanted something that was like fun and felt true to my subculture of like you know young trans people um who like have fun with each other and yeah i just wanted to make something like fun and sexy and yeah I love it <laughs> so cool because you know both of these areas I'll say you know like especially in like the sexy realm is usually like in one extreme you know it can be like we're saying like the worst thing you can ever see in it like just is super repetitive and horrible and then on the horror side it's like let's give all the tropes that we can and like, you know, make people the worst people and the ones to be afraid of. So combining these with that trans lens is something that really fascinates me because it's not only celebrating trans bodies, but it's also like, um, I guess, empowering ourselves to then say like, we belong in these genres as well. And here's how we do it. So I'm curious, is that something like is, I guess, let's say activism for the sake of the word, is that something that you also, all of you wanted to put into your films to kind of give a voice to other folks that might've had negative experiences in films previously? Um, well, I mean, I've been making like, I've been a, almost a producer and I've been producing you know, like queer and trans films, probably like eight years. I've made something like 20 of them. And, uh, our project sort of minimally is linked to um, Death and Bowling, which is like a majority trans cast and crew film Wild Cash did. And 
know, speaking of Lyle and so many other queer and trans directors, sort of the thing that's like most excited me and I think the people we work with, and it sounds like other people in this room maybe, um, is just making movies that feature those people and those identities and don't necessarily erase the darker or weirder sides of those experiences, but aren't really just another film about mom, guess what? I'm insert, you know, hackneyed cliche. Um, and with like the music videos, it's more just like, let's just put like trans people or queer people in beautiful, fantastic situations that do potentially have subtext and that we can, of course, speak to broader cultural movements or trans experiences, but are ultimately just like, this was a fun fucking video. And I haven't seen trans people be allowed to just have something that's fucking fun and weird. You know, so I think that's more what motivates what I want to do uh, than just trying to make the, you know, bathroom panic uh, film again. So some of those are lovely. Yeah, I think that's really well said, Luca. And <clears throat> yeah, I specifically did not want to make something that had an overtly political message. I just wanted to make something fun because um, I really, there's not a lot of stuff that's like about trans people that's just a fun time. Um, but I do think there's room for um, something political in the way that the films are distributed. So like I, even though I'm promoting the film at film festivals with um, free tickets, or I'm sorry, with like tickets and hoping that people will buy it. I also, if a trans person just wants to see it, I'll give them a free link, you know, especially if they're like, can't afford it. Um, and just thinking about like having community screenings that are like geared towards other trans people gathering and seeing it and like not necessarily just using the film as like something that's like in the film industry, but something that is like for the community. So I think that's where I see the political aspect of this film for me. Yeah, and, and similarly to what everyone has said, I I was not that interested in this being political or making some sort of statement because in a lot of ways, I think that that requires um, an explanation to a cis audience or requires like, it requires it being a little bit didactic in order for people to understand and I think I was much more interested in going into intricacies of like, like the nuances and intricacies of like dysphoria and of medically transitioning and like what that looks like and how that can, and sort of the thought processes behind um, mentally going through all of that. And I think that instead of using that as a chance to explain to cis people, like, this is what it's like, I wanted it to more so be something for hopefully other trans people, but also kind of just for me, <laughs> kind of like my own thoughts. And if people relate or get it, sure. But it really, I had to kind of let go of a certain idea of an audience seeing it, either trans or cis in some ways. Yeah, I think for me, just the, maybe the way that that we make in itself becomes political. Um, our crew was all queer people. We really wanted to just celebrate queerness, trans people, trans artists, and put them in the most glam, you know, fantastical types, type narrative. And, you know, in the video, I think one of the biggest messages is just like, you know, uplifting your friends, uplifting people that you love. And I think that in that in that sense, I guess it becomes political, but it wasn't like in the forefront at all um, for us. One, I mean, one thing I just want to add really quickly, um, it applies to our film, but I think it applies to others. So 
like in our film, the singer Kyler is singing about her lived experience in a way of being rejected and desired for her transness. And that plus our positionalities is a kind of politics, you know, just like making a queer or trans film is political. Um, but what I love about a festival like Translations is they really show a pretty interesting range of movies. And because they have, you know, trans curators, you know, we have people that actually understand how these films can be different or uniquely situated. And I've seen that at some of the like more like, you know, I don't know what the right word would be, what's called blockbuster queer film festivals or whatever. Um, they sometimes just do not fucking get movies, um, especially for trans people, but sometimes even for queer people. If the universe is queer or trans, the experiences are that, but the movie isn't like a repetition of some kind of cliche that's been charted out for the past 30 years. And um, I find that very upsetting when these same places then go, oh, but we need more trans films. We, we need more. And it's like, yeah, there, there's a ton. You're just programming, like, not always the best or at least the most bold or experimental. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, too. I was um, thinking about this concept, you know, once the door into the film industry has been opened, it seems like the queer community, especially, we're like rushing everyone in, like, come on, help me on this project, go, go, go. So is that like a space also that you all are trying to like empower folks and just like to make it as huge as possible to like kind of further the queerness and transness of the industry? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I've worked on a lot of films and produced a lot of films where we've had different kinds of initiatives like that. Um, there was a queer film called uh, Only Trumpets where we only wanted uh, queer or femme people on the production and we had something like a 98% uh, su success rate with that. And again, the origins of sort of my work with Kyler and Alan and Andrew uh, was on Death and Bowling, which was Lyle Cash's film that again had a majority trans cast and crew film in which trans people were playing cis and trans roles and um, it was an incredible experience to, when you have an opportunity to have this sort of utopian kind of 70s uh, feminist style experiments of, you know, just what happens when we can, you know, come together as a crew. But, but I think more than crewing, which I think can sometimes, it, it's, it's its own thing. I just think it's really important to lift other people up, you know, because we're in trans art worlds. Um, feminists, et cetera, our worlds are so small that, um, you know, even with success, I, I, I just think it makes sense to try to work together and build community. So I think it's an initiative of Alan and I, at least, and I would guess that Alan will see it. That's been what's so special about just this whole experience. It's just been creating community through making and, and you know, I've worked with Luca multiple times now on different films and every time it feels magic because we're all so comfortable and relate to each other and you know we're friends so like in the end it's it's fun to make this 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 video and it was fun to work together and it became this you know kind of ethereal you know space where we were able to create this so it was pretty magical and it's fun to do the things that like henry's talking about you know where you do like the backyard parties or you know those kinds of events to bring it to different communities. Yeah, I think it's, I'm, I want to see more um, queer and trans media, but I'm definitely, I wouldn't say that I, I all, like I, I'm wary of just having people slotted into the industry as it exists now as like a goal, um, because I think it's hard to, talk it, it i don't think that's exactly what i want to see because what i want to see is the industry change more um to have better labor practices for everyone and i think you know part of that is um going to be uplifting marginalized voices but it's it can't just be 
um, you know, mar people of marginalized identities going through the exact same messed up system that we have now, like my real hope is that this, the, the industry opens up space for different kinds of filmmaking, um, different budget levels, and again, just like treating workers better. Yeah, I, I very similarly, I think as much as I of course want representation, I think it's often a bit of a, it's kind of a bit of a backwards process to try to put representation first before employment <laughs> of people. I think it leads to these hollow, like you said, uh, slotting in and it leads to something that feels a little bit more hollow and like uh, kind of not engaging. And I think I would much rather see a world where like, regardless of where trans people are hired for projects, not just to be like trans consultants or the trans one on screen, but also like holding the boom or like, I don't know, like, or on a, comedy show because they're fucking funny and not like because they'll give us some sort of like or even you know gross things like they'll give us a grant if we have a trans in the room like i would much rather see a world where you have trans people doing all the different kinds of jobs in the industry like the grips the editors the directors and of course the actors so that I think then representation will like imbue itself onto the screen and it will make its way there. I think I see so many people on this, like, you know, what doing what we're doing that are actually making stuff that's really interesting because they're doing it from the heart. And I think a lot of the time trans creators, once you reach a certain level of like making stuff for the, the big dogs, it's kind of expected to tell a certain story over and over again. Um, and I, I would much rather see people just make stuff on all levels because they're good at the job. And then that will, the representation will come from that as opposed to this backwards practice of like trying to shove trans people to fill a quota. And I think that like how you're saying that that's like the next step, right? Is making those spaces within the crew positions and just realizing that it isn't, you know, like here's one director and then we're good, but like there needs to be slot, uh, slots, you know, there needs to be like open positions like in every aspect of the film industry, whether or not it's, you know, higher up or if it's someone from the crew who's like, coming in for their first day to do craft services or something, you know. But it, it's interesting to kind of also reflect if, I don't know if any of you do this, but like the love that I think has happened within independent film and just like production in general, because it tends to be like a lower budget and stuff, it's really like coming from the heart and it's such a passion project. So I'm curious if any of you have anything to, not necessarily tips, but just like, words of wisdom to share that like, you know, whatever that passion and truth project that you want to share has value and meaning like for filmmakers who maybe don't believe that they can get there yet. Um, I, I think one of the most beautiful things I've seen and something I would just recommend for everyone. Um, my, I've been producing this uh, web series with my friend Davi El Shai, um, who's like a lesbian filmmaker and uh, a real huge focus of her practice um, has been on building community, like doing backyard, backyard screening parties and bringing different groups together and getting people really excited. And I bring her up just because I think that that's a really effective model for independent filmmaking, because I think that too often people, myself included, can get hung up on a, well, this is going to cost 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000. And to some extent, it's like, yes, we need to pay people. And yes, we need to have like great labor practices. Um, but also when, when we're just start amongst each other or we're just starting out, um, 
it can be really beautiful and enriching and also culturally, I think, important to just build these communities and show up for people. You know, like a lot of the filmmakers I work with were there for me when I got uh, my breast augmentation, you know? So these aren't just mercenaries, these are our family. And I think that when you start to treat people that way and you work together in community, a lot of things are gonna be possible. And the second thing I would say, I'm sorry for taking so much time. Second thing I would say is just, um, embrace your like mildest dream and go for it. Cause I think sometimes people try to go for their wildest dream and it's like millions of dollars and then they hit their head against a wall, and they give up and they're just sad. But I think if you like embrace your mildest dream and you just do what you can do and it's maybe a little wild, but you can get there, um, you'll really be excited and surprised um, by what's possible. I also believe in leaning into your limitations. Like if you don't have that, you know, you know, $300,000 budget, like see what you can make with a hundred bucks, you know, like lean into it because those limitations will make you think so differently and how you can actually make something. And that ends up being special. There's room for, you know, all films. There's room for, for films that have the smallest amount of budget. And, you know, that that's something that we need. We need to keep hearing these new stories. And that's the important part, I think, is like, is hearing your voice. So keep making. Yeah, and I just want to say, like, I think that it's really important to, like, acknowledge people, the work that they do for your project, because just because it's your project, passion project it's not necessarily everyone else's um and so i believe that it's like really necessary to compensate people for their time but money is not the only way to do that um and like i've had some really great experience like bartering especially i mean the best thing to me would be if you could barter to work on someone else's project because then you're getting two things made but also not everyone has their own project so i've also like helped people move or like cooked for them or like taken headshots so just like whatever you can do um yeah like money doesn't have to be like this hard limitation because if chances are if you're making a movie you're talented and skilled and you can offer a lot more to people and i think that goes with what luca was saying about the community aspect like once you're in a community people trust you to follow through on this barter and you can have these sorts of other uh, yeah, a compensation. Yeah, I ditto on what everyone else said. I, um, I feel, I, I also think you can start from a place of who is your community right now. Like I definitely leaned on a couple people for this one because I was like, I feel like this could be an idea and um, really close friends of mine that I hadn't really had a creative partnership with were like, we're doing this. Um, and I think, so I think there's also the thing of people who love you will like make something with you um, and will just like come over to your apartment and I, and like make something in a day. And I completely agree with Alan that like your limitations are only going to make you more talented. If everybody started off with like a hundred million dollar budget, movies would be so boring because the coolest stuff in film, most of the time came from that sort of like, from those limitations of even like a camera angle was a certain way because you can't afford a certain part of the set. Like just things like that, um, or I think why I love independent film so much and why I like hope to stick around. Cause I think people get so interesting and creative and things that are kind of normative to us now in film started because somebody didn't have the ability to do one thing or another. I think that also applies to writing, write for what you're able to do. If you can have a conversation in an apartment and that's the short, right. And I think 
that also goes into writing a lot. Just write all the time. Um, for both your mildest dream and your wildest dream, write all of that. Because um, also you never know what, <laughs> you never know if somebody is just around the corner ready to make any any of those dreams come true. And that's also a moment to be prepared and have your wildest dream ready to go. And then be like, okay, I have a, you turn that down. Okay, cool. I have this other thing that I'm able to do and sort of run the gamut of like, I have this thing I can shoot in my apartment in a day and I have a $10 million film ready and everything in between. And I think part of that is just like getting skilled at being able to um, work with what you have and train your eye and your brain which are the two things you don't need a budget to train. Hmm. That's so good. I was recently just talking to someone about like how important it is to begin in independent film because there is that gorilla aspect of like, we need to do everything we can, you know, in the most creative way possible. And so we can lend techniques to folks who like have these massive budgets because they never had to think about it, right? They never had a line of skateboard, you know, whatever it is. And so I'm really curious, is that something that you think as we lean into these, like, I guess, our financial limitations and stuff like that, that doesn't have to narrow down the story. You know what I mean? Like we can make these amazing things regardless of whatever the cost is. And we can just push that to the side and really get to the art of it. Cause I think a lot of it comes from people being afraid that they don't have the money for it, you know, but there's great ideas out there. Yeah. I mean, like you have nothing to lose, you know, just making what you can when you can, like if you let that stop you from making what you want to make your, you dream this, this story that you have thought up, you know, you've had it, the back of your mind just make it see what comes out it's so good <laughs> like genuinely <laughs> just hearing that you know like just make it like that's something i think if i was told that you know however many years ago like i would probably have done it rather than like yeah right all right it's good but like it's not worth it you know um and so i'll kind of twist things a little bit if i can um and I want to talk about like the idea of writing a story and then like getting to production. Like, did all of you come from the same place of like starting there? Or did you start at like a different point? How did you come to production? Well, I think, okay, so Luca and I met with Kyler and our, our, so our costume designer, Stacy Ellen Rich and my partner, Andrew Lush. And we, what I did basically was started off with like a, a lookbook. And through that lookbook, I created a narrative that could possibly begin to shape. And I think that's just the way that I like to work. Uh, listening to the song multiple times as well. Like, what can I, what does it make me, what, 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 what's, what ideas are ignited from just like listening to it. Um, oftentimes songs just, do that for me an image comes up and I, i'll like lean into that image and then i'll keep creating world building off of that and yeah and that's so that's what we did we just made a lookbook um different short films that we really love maya darren um you know different artists that we really are into and and, and the feel and look of, of different films and we just discussed that and that's where it, that's where it just kept going and the, the source music, I mean, just sort of the premise for the record is it's just the hits. And um, I wanted to combine uh, my passion for uh, noise music with uh, my passion for the Indigo Girls and a kind of Vegas version of noise music. Uh, and so that kind of also informed sort of how we took it with the video and so forth and who was brought on to do it, you know. Um, I wrote the script first and then started working on like a mood board. Um, I just kept like, anytime I would come across images that I felt had something to do with the film, I would like 
put them in there. Um, I did write the script with the production in mind. I knew that I wanted to make something within a certain time period and I knew certain locations that I had access to and I wanted to make it as few, like something that wouldn't require any extras or like anything like any locations that were like a business or anything because I knew it was like, we shot it during COVID and like, I just didn't know what that would be like. Um, so yeah, and but it was like definitely taking a lot of like points of inspiration and like little small ideas that I had been thinking about for years and just like finally finding the project to put all of these tendencies that I had um, into this one script that was like written for some specific set of circumstances. Yeah, my, um, my experience was uh, I had an entirely different story that I thought would be a cool short film. And then I kind of realized it was a little bit too much of a story to be a short, let alone a cheap short. So I, um, then I shortly after read this story and knew, I, you know, and I knew that there was two people well, there are three in the original, whatever. But there are uh, three, pe uh, two people and a cabin. And I was like, okay, um, that's good news. And I read it and instantly saw the the transness in the story. Um, and then, yeah, I, I wrote it and then same thing, did a mood board, um, did like a dramaturgy packet with all the references and metaphors and stuff to basically explain. Um, what was happening because a lot of it is just visuals um and then um we dina and i dina my producing partner and i like just were scrounging a team together and we went to a cabin for three days and <laughs> went and did it <laughs> it just makes me so grateful you know just so appreciative that there's that ability to kind of like take whatever it is that you're reading or inspired by to then produce it into something that's like becoming such an aspect of our culture. You know, like film does so much to reflect the world that we want or the world that we see. And so I just want all of you to know that that's something that is very, very important to me. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart for being able to contribute to that. You know, um, and I'll, I'll say maybe as like a little, Fun question. I'll teeter off on that. Um, do any of you have like Easter eggs or something that we should be looking out for, like to really see something that might have been overlooked in the process of making each of your projects? I can start. I mean, I have my film has very dense production design. Um, and it's been really awesome that like a lot of people watching it have noticed like a bunch of like tiny things in the background, like putting certain books or like posters. Mm -hmm. um, but so far nobody has noticed that we made our own brand of beer that they're mm -hmm. drinking the whole time. It's Sluts, which is, and like a parody of like the Schlitz beer label. Um, so yeah, look out for that. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's exactly what I was thinking about too. <laughs> um, so the previous video that Alan and I uh, worked on or did was um, Satan's Tears for Kyler O'Neill and uh, Alan's partner Andrew Lush directed it and um, uh, Stacey Ellen Rich did all the costumes and we loved her work because she styles uh, like Ron Afey and uh, Kayla Tungay and a lot of other performance artists. and. Um, we've all had like a very strong uh, attraction, you know, to the onk um, for some time since childhood for me. So um, uh, the same uh, piece of jewelry by Stacy is in both videos. Um, and, uh, yeah. and links them in various uh, obvious and not obvious ways. Yeah, we should make a double feature. <laughs> And 
Yeah, mine's just a lot of biblical references and mm -hmm. um, references like the bottom of her dress, um, the white dress that you see, we hand painted um, to have um, different kinds of flowers and olives. Um, it's basically just a lot of the Bible is mm -hmm. just all throughout it. Um, and again, like literature, there's um, a bunch of references to like Edgar Allan Poe, um, as well as the original uh, story. I wanna thank you all again um, for being here. And I know that we want everyone that's at the festival to obviously like follow you and support your work and continue like on this train of momentum so if you have anywhere that folks can find you, is there specific websites or social media platforms that you prefer or that you have more work on, I guess, whatever it is that you would like to shout out and let us know? Um, I'd love to invite everyone to follow Kyler's World uh, since she can't be here. That's K-Y-L-E-R-Z World. Um, that's on Instagram and I'm at Luca Fisher. And um, if you want to follow the web series I'm producing, it's just at the Lovers web series. Yeah, um, the, for Bros Before, it's Bros Before Movie on Instagram. And um, my personal handle on Instagram and Twitter is Degeneracy Now. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, at J. Kiernan O'Brien. <laughs> no punctuation on Instagram. And my website is jkiernanobryan.com. Awesome. Um, and I'm at underscore Alan S. Amaya underscore on Instagram. Um, you can find my website, alanamaya.com to look at some of my design work and some of my video work as well. Um, I'm on Vimeo under Milk and Cookies, M-I-L-K-N-C-O-O-K-Y-S. <laughs> Well, thank you all, genuinely. I really appreciate it. Like just from the beginning to the end, right? Like seeing that whole process that you've been into and diving into kind of like the campy queerness of horror and all of these different things that we don't see. It's very much an honor to be able to share this space with you. So thank you. And I'm very excited. Hopefully you all are excited to, to be screening and can see it as much as in person as possible. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you.